Hello there, you're tuned to the only show on English radio that brings the voices of our youth straight to you from their schools. I'm Angela Lim and today campus is coming to you live from Nian Polytechnic when the students from the Health Sciences School will be discussing the challenges that healthcare professionals will face in the 21st century. Now we live in an era that has seen tremendous developments in the healthcare industry, but with technological advancements of our time, there are also new challenges that our healthcare professionals will have to face. The increased pace of, pace of life in Singapore has made way for a very rapidly aging population, something urgent that we have to address here in Singapore. And estimates show that by 2030, close to a fifth of our population will consist of people above the age of 65. That's more than double the 9% in 2008. So how ready is our healthcare industry to care for this nation going forward? And also with increased mobility and the liberty to travel more freely, healthcare professionals will face greater challenges controlling the spread of infectious diseases as well. How ready are we to tackle a future pandemic outbreak? And also, do we have the necessary manpower and logistics to care for a nation of changing demographics in the event of this epidemic? Now, waiting to weigh in with their views on these questions are the students pursuing diplomas in nursing and optometry from Nian Polytechnic. But before we plunge into our discussion and hear from our students, let's introduce our panellists for today. Dr. Madeline Chu is founder and resident doctor of MW Medical. Madeline has worked extensively with the aged and also she's also had a quite a lot of experience working during the SARS outbreak back in 2003. Madeline, great to have you on the program. Thank you. Also, our teacher or lecturer from Nian Polytechnic School of Health Sciences, Mr. Chong Ching Liang, is here to tell us a bit more about his perspective as well, working with the students here in the Health Sciences School. And uh, our student panelist, Subramaniam, is here. He's a nursing student and together with Geraldine Su, who's also a nursing, are going to give us some perspective in terms of what they anticipate will be challenges going forward once they graduate from Nian Poly. That's a round of applause for our panelists, please. Yeah, Dr. Chu, I want to, uh, just to kickstart the discussion based on your experiences working extensively with the elderly, also during the SARS pandemic. Can you tell us what you anticipate would be some of the bigger challenges that the healthcare industry will face in the next five to ten years? Um, for the aged population, actually, we do a lot of home care. We actually do mobile doctor, mobile nurse and all that. And so um, I think increasingly the aged population is going to have more and more demands on home care. Um, but home care, while it sounds primitive, is actually at a higher level. It's like going back to basics. So you need to start off knowing what is in the hospital to then assess who is suitable for home care and then to see what you can do for them in home care. And I think that will be a big challenge because um, once you move to home care, this economy of scale, like one nurse to six patients to eight patients, that no longer exists. Um, and that's a difficult. The other big challenge is that the aged population is going to be a double-tiered aged, meaning that not only are you going to deal with an 89-year-old, you're going to deal with her son or her her children who is also 60-something. And they can offer very little physical support uh, to sort of help feed the patient and all that. So I think um, that that is a big challenge because you're actually doubling or tripling your age of population. Right. So in a way, home care is something that you anticipate would be something that would be quite a viable answer to a lot of the questions that our elderly are facing at the moment. Yes, Thank I you. would think home care um, for the aged would be a big thing uh, okay. because after hospitalization, they've got to go somewhere. Right. Mm. So when you think about the elderly, and of course, you know, that's going to be something that's going to happen more and more eventually, that there'll be more healthcare professionals needed to provide support to the elderly and our aging population as well. What else do you think are some challenges that the healthcare professionals or maybe some of our students here might face when they go out to care for them? I think for this generation of nursing students, when you become nurses, um, the group of relatives um, are going to be relatively uh, in the know, or they've had experience, um, at least one of their parent or two, or you know, some relatives who has been ill for some time, and as such, they are going to sort of criticize or critique your technique, your care, um, your thought processes, and challenge your your propositions or things that you suggest for the patients. Yet another double-edged sword in a way, because then we have a lot of information online, which is great, but at the same time, there'll be a lot of challenges with people trying to second-guess maybe what the healthcare professionals are saying. Yeah, um, but th this comes all the time, you know. It's like um, Angelina Jolie now. This information is <laughs> for this gene has been known to us for good 10, 11 years, 
but look at the the <laughs> the craze about this information suddenly and how people are talking about double mastectomy and all that. So it's the same. You've got to keep up with medical, real medical information. You also have to got to keep up with your Facebook and tweet and WeChat or whatever that comes with it. Right. So before we hear from Ching Liang and also our student panelists, I want to ask a little bit more about your experience, Dr. Chu, working during the SARS pandemic. Of course, that's another area of healthcare that really needs quite a bit of attention, given that the world's so connected these days. When you were working under the SARS period or during the SARS period, what were some of the biggest problems that came up for you? I think SARS came at a very, very um, sort of difficult time because that period of time people had neglected infectious diseases. Even in Singapore, we felt that it was not going to be a problem anymore. And so it was a little bit caught flat-footed for all the countries. Number two, I think um, China being uh, rather sort of hesitant about information, we had very little free information from them. And because of this, uh, there was kind of an overflow. Um, SARS was scary as well because healthcare professionals were, were dying or hospitalized. Um, and because of that, we actually worry for every single one who's servicing any patient. Um, my experience is an epidemiologist, so I look upon data and then I decide, um, for example, which sector is hot and I, I need to sort of keep them calm and, and I need to shut down wards and things like that. And I think that was the biggest challenge. Um, the the interesting thing was 10 years ago, we, we had quite a bit of mandate. We could sort of keep people at their home. We send food there. We put in a camera there and monitor them. The question is whether this generation, when this happens again, will the um, population be as compliant uh, and, and will they be more willing to, to follow through? Right. Great questions there, Dr. Chu. We're going to ask the students what they think yeah. as well, given <laughs> they are the next generation of healthcare professionals. Let's go now uh, to Ching Liang. Ching Liang, here, you've been lecturing here at Neon Poly as well. You've worked extensively with these health science school students. Tell us a bit about what you think they would have to anticipate as future healthcare professionals. First, first of all, I'm not a nursing lecturer. I teach um, sociology and psychology and current affairs. Let me, let me just frame the challenges in two words, huh? apathy and empathy, things that I constantly bring to the classroom. In under apathy, we're looking at uh, two things. One is our nursing shortage. Second is uh, our view of our own health. Now, let's go with the view of our own health. Um, the School of Health Sciences, through the Department of Optometry, um, just recently ran a um, uh, f uh, sort of a subsidized screening to a certain extent of this thing called age-related macular degeneration. And I think what the optometry students will tell you, once they became optometry students, they realize how much we take our own health for granted. In other words, we don't go and see an optometrist until we st can't see anymore, wake up one day, and that is a problem. Now, now as a student, they can see that. But the, the, the challenge facing optometrists and nurses really is when people come to you for help, sometimes it's advanced stage. How do you then help them? So that's one of the key challenges. It is not the nurse's fault. It's not optometry's fault. Do we take ownership of our own health? So that's one big challenge. The second challenge is, of course, the nursing shortage. Optometry is not an issue because it's still seen as a good profession, makes money. Nursing, on, on the other hand, um, has got a huge problem. It's not a popular choice as a career. I can tell you right here, we've got 100 students here. Maybe a significant number didn't pick this as a career. But our challenge then as an educator in within the School of Nursing is how at the end of three years, even if you don't become a nurse, you've learned enough to say that the skills I learned save lives, maybe my own family, even if I don't work as a nurse. So once they come in, we're fairly confident we can then show you the benefits of this career. The problem is how do I get you to apply so that you can have this enriching experience of figuring out that nursing is a good profession. Right. And I think this is a huge challenge because society, society still has got this weird stigma that nursing is somehow a domestic worker job. Right. Now, if you, if you look at this phrase, doctor treats, nurses heals. Doctor see a patient maybe for 10, 15, 20% of the time, 80% the nurses take care of the patient mm. to heal them. Right. Now, for some reason, as a society, we're rather stupid about this. Mm. We, 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 we glorify the doctors, and they should because they have lots of training, but we don't see that 80% of the people that is looking after our loved ones, in fact, we use them as almost like a domestic worker. There's something wrong here, and this, this sort of thing has to be addressed right. at a societal level. 
let me just quickly go to empathy because I know you're running out of airtime. I do talk a lot. My students will, will tell you that. <laughs> um, empathy, it presents another challenge. What empathy is, is seeing things from another person's point of view. Now, how do you teach this? And this is problematic. Whether it's optometry students or nursing students, how do you see the point of view from the person you're trying to help? Because if you can't, you've just lost connection with them. How do you teach 17, 18 year old when they go out to work to see things from a 90 year old person's point of view? When they tell you it's pain, they are not nagging, they're not whining, they are in pain. How do you teach them to see it? You can't. You have to push them into contact with them, clinical attachment, or through things like the AMD screening to get them, get in touch with the people they're connected with. Hopefully, they could learn to be. Um, hopefully they can learn to be empathetic. Right. But this is not, uh, 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 there is hope in this because Singapore is growing. As you correctly said, in 17 years' time, 20 people in this 100 people room will be above 65, which mm -hmm. means that eventually there will be 65 year old nurses and optometrists, and right. finally we'll have true empathy. But right now, as nursing educators and optometry right. educators, we need to do this. So, how do we create that empathy? I think that's the question. And also, how do we reframe the idea that skilled labor? has to be something that we associate nursing with as well. We're going to hear from our students in just a short while, as well as our student panellists. We're coming to you live from the Health Sciences School at Nian Polytechnic, and today we're discussing the challenges facing healthcare professionals in the 21st century. Coming to you live from Nian Poly, stay tuned on campus on 938 Live. We're coming to you live from Nian Polytechnic. Today we're discussing with the students from the School of Health Sciences what the challenges are in terms of healthcare professionals and what they would face in the coming years. We're going to go straight to the student panelists here. Uh, Subramaniam, tell us a little bit about what you think are some challenges that the nursing industry might face since you're a nursing student. Hi, I'm Subramaniam from Health Science, nursing year 3 student. Okay, the challenges that comes to mind right now is actually time management. So what actually we have to actually be uh, time conscious because we have to uh, take orders from the doctors. We have to care for patients. We have to also see family members' requests. Uh, at the same time, we have to uh, keep up with the growing demands of quality patient care. But they, we are also required to remain with the current ever-changing education and standard of practice. So it's quite a challenge for us because we have to... Every day is a learning process for us. Right, so constantly keeping yourself challenged, but at the same time coping as well. Are there other things that you feel you know might be very challenging for you when you go out into the nursing industry? Uh, as I said, nursing is something that uh, it never stops. You mm -hmm. have to learn every day. Right. Uh, like I've come from basic mm. as a healthcare assistant, so from assistant nurse. Then right now I'm taking my diploma in nursing. So it's like. Never stop. You have to keep learning in, in order for you to improvise. Right. Constantly upgrading. So the yes. attitude is very important, yes. do you think, in this case. Let's go a little bit to Geraldine as well. Geraldine Su is a, a student here at the Nursing School of Nursing at Nian Poly. What do you think, Geraldine, in terms of anticipated challenges you might face? Mm, I feel that for us nurses, we actually have to fight back our emotions because uh, most of our patients are actually terminally ill and they actually are long stay in the hospitals and they are also um, mainly elderly patients and they actually have no uh, relatives coming to visit them. So uh, for us nurses, um, even if the patient passed on, right, we could not even um, cry in the public because it's our professional image and we cannot because of our emotion, we lost our concentration for our other patients. Developing emotional resilience, you think, is something that, you know, maybe you can be trained here in schools as well or prior to the nursing uh, um, work. For emotion-wise, it's, I think, based on experience mm -hmm. because it's not a one-day thing that we can actually grow from there. Um, because for our attachment, it's like um, two weeks or three weeks maximum and we don't get to see patients throughout. Because the patients are all long stay here, like it can be months to even six months to the maximum. Right. Yeah. So much like what Subramaniam has mentioned earlier, so a lot of it is learning on the job, being resilient during your your work as well, and something that you can't really be taught in that sense to learn very short while. We're going to hear from the rest of our student audience in just a bit. We're coming to you live from the Nian Polytechnic School of Health Sciences, and today we're discussing the challenges that healthcare professionals in Singapore face or will face in the coming years. Stay tuned on campus on 938 Live. 
for staying tuned to campus on Night Three Live. I'm Angela Lim, and of course, we're coming to you live from Neon Polytechnic today, discussing with the students from the School of Health Sciences what their challenges they anticipate would be in terms of the healthcare profession in the 21st century. We're also going to go right to the student audience in just a bit, but we want to reintroduce our panelists first. Dr. Madan Chu is the founder and resident doctor of MW Medical. Chang Cheng Liang is lecturer from the School of Health Sciences at Neon Poly, and our student panelists are Subramaniam and Geraldine Su who are both nursing students here at Neon Poly as well. Uh, another round of applause for our panellists. Now, I want to go straight to the student audience. Now, we've heard from our panellists the idea that, you know, the idea of nursing and healthcare professionals being skilled labour, that's something we want to look at. And also, other challenges that you might face might include things like having a social life, an active social life, despite working for the healthcare sector. And of course, we want to go straight to the floor right now. We have a comment there. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Larry from uh, Nian Poly, Year 1 nursing student. Uh, well, actually, with the technology today, uh, with patients actually doubting doctors or nurses' uh, advice, it is actually no surprise that we can self-diagnosis with the help of the internet. However, I feel that some may take diagnosis the wrong way and may turn out counterproductive and dangerous. And uh, I hope that the government will actually educate the society more on the prevention of spread of the current uh, uh, pandemic like HN79, HN79. Right. Thank you. So the information that's out there could, again, be like a double-edged sword in the sense that people start relying very much on the information they can get easily. So how do you think, Larry, that people can still be seen uh, to be relying more on a doctor's or a nurse's or healthcare professional's advice or recommendations rather than going to Google, for example, to try and uh, heal themselves? Yeah, just by uh, relying on a doctor's order, it will actually be more uh, accurate and actually, if there's any problem, the doctor will give you uh, information firsthand. Right. We definitely want to look at that as well, whether you guys think that it's going to be another problem for you when you go out and work. But people will question your authority using their own knowledge that they managed to get as well. Let's go to another student here. Hello. Hi, I'm Nora Jana, year two, nursing student. Nora, what do you think would be one of the other challenges that you might face? I mean, apart from people challenging your role as a nurse when you go out to work, what are some other things that you might think might be a problem? Um, usually it's like the patient's demands and even the relative demands. Sometimes even when we are doing our the doctor's order, um, the family like will be like staring at us, looking at what we're doing. It's like they are afraid that we will injure the patient itself. But really we are not really injuring the patient, we are helping it. But sometimes they do not trust us, you know. So it's like we have to clarify with them and then make them understand that we're trying our best to make the patient healthy and Recover from the situation they're having right now. Right. So you have, in a way, it must be a way of earning the patient's trust. And that might be a challenge for you going out into the nursing world. Is this yeah. something that's based on experience for you, Nuro? Um, yeah, there's some experience. Because um, most of my patients are dementia. So they might, most of the times, like, once I finish my shift, I went home. When I come back, and they they forgot about me. But that's what I thought. But no, that's not what happened to me. Is that... They once you build the trust, right? They will like think of you often, and then they will touch you, hold you, and sometimes they even remember you more than their own children. I had one patient, right? She beat her own child, asked the child to go away, but she called me instead. It's like, come, come here, stand here, stand here. This person won't bully me. It feels, um, touch. Oh my god, <laughs> it's okay. Take your time. Um. But it's a beautiful moment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think healthcare professionals with heart, in a way, putting your heart out there begets the trust of the patient as well. And then that delivers a very, very different kind of nursing healthcare provision as well in terms of the service that you're giving to the community, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes it's, once the patient remembers you, like they appreciate what you do, it's more worth it than the challenges that you had. It's true that the challenges has built up this by this has passed, but what the patients give it to you, what they remember about you is is worth it. It's really like you cannot describe the feeling, but once you go through it, you will appreciate it more. Right. How do we then cultivate that heart of passion in our healthcare professionals? We're going to hear from the rest of our student audience. Thank you, Noral, for sharing. Let's go to our next member of the audience here. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie from Optometry Year 3. Um, so my point of this is uh, I feel that sometimes patients, um, they kind of like don't know what's going on to them. So like for example, the eyesight, they don't know that why their eyesight deteriorated. So they feel that like 
um, it's kind of like part of aging that their eyesight is getting like that. So they don't know if they should seek help or not. So by the time sometimes when they come and seek help, it's too late. Kind of like um, like AMD, it'll be too late. So um, if you are able to tell them like what are signs and symptoms that they may feel, so maybe they can seek um, treatment earlier to prevent further loss of the vision. Yeah. So um, for example, optometrists, right, we can like give them advices, like um, whether is it necessary for them to seek an ophthalmologist immediately because um, there's limited resources. We don't want everybody to rush to the ophthalmologist because it's expensive. And also, um, like, this waste of resources is not necessary. Right, and of course, ophthalmology is something that's definitely going to come up quite a bit with our aging population as well. So maybe prevention sometimes is better than cure. If we can educate our patients to think more in terms of how can I prevent something like that, or in the event that I do need to seek medical help, can I actually be treated instead of being resigned to the fact that, oh, you know, it's part of aging. There is a treatment available, and we need to get that out to the patients. And we're going to go to our next uh, audience member here. Hello. Uh, hi, <coughs> yeah, I'm Vichy from <laughs> year two student from uh, nursing. Right. Yeah, so uh, I guess like society look at nursing like it is a low skill prof- uh, profession. Like nurses do dirty jobs like cleaning up, uh, cleaning bus pa- patient butts, and do shit jobs like really more than. Sorry, uh, uh, do really more than to, uh, like satis- like the satisfaction that comes from the job. For example, when your patient gets discharged from the hospital, it's really a super humongous uh, accomplishment that we can make. You know? mm. Yes, uh, we do make like jobs, but we are nurses, and the goal of doing this job is to cure the patient. Right. So doing simple things such as communicating with the patient really um, enlighten their days. Uh, from there, also, we can also uh, know what's their problems, and from there, we can mm. do intervention for them. So uh, for me personally, I will approach the patient during my free times, especially in the evening shift. Uh, there's not much to do. Uh, so I will just go to the patient when their relative member are not down to there. I will just um, talk with them, uh, like those Kopitiam talks, right. just anyhow talk and <laughs> just know them better. Right. So, so there's quite a lot of dedication on that part, Vitri, also that, you know, like what Neural has said, a lot of it comes from the personal care and concern you have for the patients. I'm also wondering, I mean, like Ching Yang was mentioning earlier, a lot of people who come into nursing might not necessarily have chosen it as their first choice profession. Were you one of those as well? Yeah, personally, I'm one of those also. Right. Yeah. And yet you found a way to care about patients. So that's what I think I'm curious about, which is how you've managed to cultivate that kind of compassion and that kind of love for your patients, despite not having this as an initial a choice of profession? Uh, maybe I think from Nyan Poli, they teaches me how <laughs> to uh, build confidence in talking to the patient. So mm. I actually, I, I don't have that passion for nursing, but as I go through with all this attachment, uh, the rapport with the patients really built my interest in this course. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the exposure, just the exposure to trying it out, caring for patients, that has helped you, you know, learn more about it and that actually it is something that requires a lot of skill, a lot of effort and definitely a lot of expertise and then taking pride in that as yeah. well. Thank you for sharing, Fuji. Let's go to uh, our next student uh, audience member here. Hi, what's your name? Oh, hi, I'm Melvin. Melvin, you're from the Philippines, am yes, I right? Yes, I am. Tell us a bit more about uh, why you got into this school, in a nursing school as well, and tell us a bit more about any challenges you think you might have faced on your attachments. Oh, um, I actually, uh, I was raised uh, back in the Philippines. I used to have, and I used to join different um, community services. So we build houses, we plant trees, and we actually educate um, uh, those um, students who can't afford to go to school. So I had, I sort of uh, had the 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 gist of it you know like you know learning and uh, uh, teaching them and all that all that uh, community service so i kind of uh, figure out what i want to do uh, with my life so it's actually i th- i think um i'm called to 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 be a nurse or i'm i maybe i'm even born to be a nurse and but again um we have challenges that we may face in the future especially maybe uh, after we graduate so um but i'm glad that um i went to Nian Poly uh, health sciences school uh, maybe because they, uh, they prepare us well to a working world. It does seem that the education process is very important in the sense when nurses are given training or any healthcare professionals are given training or taught in schools, there is a way of inculcating that love and passion for the job as well that enables you to be better healthcare professionals. So it looks like, you know, in terms of education, this is definitely one way to go to create more love for the job. I want to turn uh, the attention a little bit more uh, to the idea of nursing as skilled labor, you know, revamping, for example, the image of nurses. I want to talk to Dr. Chu on this because earlier Ching Liang had 
had mentioned that people tend to see nurses as a job that is, you know, perhaps less a subordinate to doctors. You know, what, what do you think about that? I think nursing job is really very different from doctoring. Doctoring is a diagnostic machine. You see what is wrong, you um, prescribe the treatment. Nursing job is an executor. You actually execute these orders and then you need a feedback loop. Um, so they actually work hand in hand. The problem I feel for nursing is why it's been treated sort of like a base is because of the handling of um, what is considered mon- you know, mundane things, stools, urine, um, diapers, changing clothes, bathing. But these are absolutely necessary. If you do enough nursing, you'll know. If, you do, if the patient doesn't have bowel movement, something has gone wrong. If the patient doesn't urine, you know something has gone wrong. So all these are actually feedback loop. There are specimens and all those. And unfortunately, I think for us, we've started the wrong way. Yeah. Um, I think many years ago in Florence Nightingale, she came from a fairly good family and therefore nursing at that point of time was viewed differently. And from here, um, people feel that the nurses have come from a less prestigious family and hence that sort of perception. But I think it's changing. I think the nurses are beginning, they're nurse practitioners now, the nurses now are actually listening to orders and then interpreting the orders and doing it. And currently, I think there are many, many sort of ways of development. We have graduate nursing programs and so forth. So I think it will change, but it takes a lot of changes as well internally for the nursing group of people. The nurses have to take on them and tell tell everybody, I am a nurse, I've got these professional standards, and this is what I'm going to do. Right. Definitely the healthcare professional nurse in this case has to embody the kind of skills that they have been trained with and equipped with. And also I think with a lot of students here today, very impressed to see that a lot of you have a lot of heart as well when it comes to serving the community. We're going to hear more about how we can change the image of nursing or healthcare professionals in general as well in just a moment when campus returns on 9th Street Live. We're coming to you from Nian Poly, and today we're discussing the challenges that healthcare professionals face in Singapore in the 21st century. Coming back to you in just a moment, do stay with us. We're coming to you live from Neon Polytechnic. The students at the Health Sciences School are telling us a little bit more about how they feel about the challenges that healthcare professionals will face in the coming years. We've been chatting so far with the student audience and they've been ta- telling us a little bit more about how much they love their work despite the fact that some of them might not have actually initially chosen this as a profession. But we also want to go a little bit more into what Dr. Chu was saying earlier, that there has to be an image revamp of nursing in particular. Let's hear from one of our nursing students there. Hello. Um, I'm Mei Shan from right. Nursing Year One. Mei Shan, what do you think can be done in terms of the image of nurses that allow people to respect, not just respect you more, but also listen to you more, make your job a bit easier? Okay, I think that... Um, for the professionalism of uh, being a nurse, um, grooming is definitely one of the expect. And um, f- when we think about grooming for nurses in Singapore context, it's always um, prim and proper and tie up your hair, uniform straight and all that. But nobody takes note that when you do makeup, um, just light makeup um, to look pink and rosy. And when you talk to your patient, you present certain kind of image that makes them feel that you are reliable. And, you know, it kind of cheer up their day as well. Right. In a way, if you look at nursing as a service that you're rendering the patient and not so much just that, oh, we're just here to provide some kind of unskilled labor, for example, that might change the impression because when you're taking pride in your appearance and in yourself as a whole, people also start taking you a lot more seriously. Thanks, Mishan. I'm going to hear now from another member of the audience. Hello. Hi. Okay, what's your name, please? Um, my name is Lynette. I'm um, year two student. Right. Lynette, what do you think of the idea that when it comes to healthcare, there's a, often a lot of time, you know, that's being sacrificed in terms of the number of hours you have to put into it, the physical toll that it might take on you. What, what has your experience been so far in terms of having a social life, for example? Um, my social life before I started nursing is like hanging out with friends, going out and like partying at night. But ever since I have... Um, I mean, I started attachment and like sacrificing half of my time in nursing, um, in the hospital. Then my social life like go down. 
like become lesser right. and not to hang out with friends. So clearly something has to be done in the sense that, you know, we have to make it a bit easier for our nurses or any healthcare professionals as well to have that balance of being able to relax and have a good time with loved ones while balancing their professional work, you know, in hospitals as well. Um, That's something you would like to see? Maybe. Yeah, most probably like cut short our hours, okay. our working hours, and right. maybe like try to encourage more people to join nursing so that mm. there will be more people and other people can get lesser time, eh, get more timings to have more social life and all. Right, so the importance of letting people see that nursing is something that they can have a fulfilling life with outside work as well. We're going to hear, uh, of course, Ching Liang, I hopefully you'll be able to wrap up for us today on what has been discussed so far. I mean, one other important thing would be how society has been perceiving nursing as a profession as well. Let, let's kind of talk a little bit about that. I hope sessions like this would uh, allow the Singaporean society to see nurses as, as um, a group of people that is integral to the overall health of the country. Um, but in order to get to that point, you need to have nurses. So sessions like this, you know, from FIT, who comes in at first year and says, oh my God, what am I doing here as a nurse? To the point where I may not still be a nurse, but at least I, I, I connect with my patients and I feel good about myself. And I think Society needs to get to that point because until we, you can come in, see the value of this job, we can't. Let me just tell you a story of, 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 of a registration, doing a registration. Um, a parent came in. Basically, the parent says, look, my daughter just missed the cutoff point for nursing. Um, I want to get her into nursing. And so we says we can't, unfortunately, because that's a minimum. But, um, but what, what she's really saying, uh, in, in the end, when she realized she couldn't get her way, she just says, oh, you know, Actually, I don't even know how I want to do nursing because uh, it is a job no one wants. I don't think you should be so picky. And I think that attitude must change. I'm saying that it's not her fault because if everyone sees that way, she will see it that way. But we have to change. Right. Definitely, you know, that changing that face of nursing as well. And a lot of healthcare professionals comes from many different places. The education process, of course, the nurses and the healthcare professionals embodying the kind of skills and expertise they have. And also Singaporeans in general, being able to see beyond just the fact that there's traditional stereotypes of nursing as well. This has been a fantastic discussion here at Neon Polytechnic with the students of the Health Sciences School. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Campus and 938 Live.